Good morning, everyone. Thanks so much for coming. My name is Alan Hutchison. I'll be your host for the next few days. And I really appreciate everyone making the effort to get here today and be here so early in the morning, or at least if you're a Google person, this is kind of early in the morning. Uh, we've got a lot of people flown in from out of town. It's great to see you. I really am glad that you were able to make it. Uh, you're going to hear a lot from me later, but right now we, I've got the special pleasure of introducing Shannon Marr. He is the engineering director for the office here in London, and he just has a few words of welcome. So, Shannon. Good morning, everybody. And I guess we have a few pieces. Oh, don't, don't, don't apply to you, you know what I say, then you can just say, you know. Uh, well, stay away from that. Uh, I, do, I do want to say good morning. I, I, I echo uh, Alan's thoughts. It's uh, great to see a bunch of people coming in from uh, out of town. I, I looked at the, at the agenda that you guys have. There's a very good set of people giving presentations. Uh, I, as part of, uh, of my responsibility, I get to, to, to talk to you for about 15 minutes about what we do here in uh, Google London. And what, I'm an engineering director, uh, site director for London, and what my perspective on the, uh, the testing problems that we have, uh, testing automation problems we have here in London. Specifically, I'm responsible for Google's world, worldwide for the, uh, our mobile activities. Uh, so I will obviously have a mobile bent. I tell uh, anybody who wants me to give a presentation that, that the toll for that presentation is for me to, uh, to talk about mobile. Uh, I hope it's not a high toll. So, uh, well, let's see, how do I back up on this thing? So, welcome. <laughs> uh, that was easy. Uh, on the agenda, again, I'll talk about testing on Google. I think uh, some people may have some uh, preconceived notions about uh, what testing in Google uh, is all about and what Google's uh, uh, natural inclinations towards testing is about uh, because of some of uh, our products and some of our history. I'd like to go through that. I think some of that's interesting and some of that is definitely germane. And then talk to you about some of the challenges in the mobile world. And there are significant challenges. I did notice and, and met a couple of people that will also be talking about uh, this, basically the same topic uh, later on in the agenda. So testing in Google. What do you guys think about when you think about testing in Google? Do you maybe think about Gmail? Gmail beta? Gmail beta that was initially introduced as beta on April 1st, an auspicious date, 2004, and is still in beta. Does that, does that, does that uh, sort of ring a bell? Uh, what do you think of, about what I, I consider to be maybe the coolest product that we have out there, Google Earth? Uh, but even we understand that, with, with, with that, uh, that we get a little bit of reputation. I don't know if you can see this. But this is, this is the coolest t-shirt that we have. And, and Google is all about food and t-shirts, by the way. Uh, it says Google Earth, uh, 4.7 billion years and still in beta. Uh, that's, a, that's, that's the age of the Earth. We, we, we expect that at some point, less than 4.7 billion years, we'll get out of beta for Gmail, by the way. If you consider some of the background of Google, uh, maybe you can see where we get our perspective. And I'll also uh, go into this a little bit further. But uh, circa 1997, that is eight and a half years ago, uh, Backrub, which became Google, was an academic part, uh, project at uh, Stanford. So the company has deep roots, very deep roots in the academic world. Uh, and is actually uh, the, the company is actually very very new in, in, in the sense of, uh, of just longevity in years, uh, which has is, which is led to, to a couple of interesting things. So what we have here is a, that's, that's a picture of the Google Data Center uh, in 1997. Uh, and, and, and again, you can maybe draw some inferences of what we thought about uh, for QA and testing back then as we're trying to develop uh, very good, very effective search technologies. Uh, and, and What's happened as, as we now move forward to 2006? This is actually a couple of year old picture of one of our data centers. Uh, I think it was 2004. It's actually a full generation old. But one of the things I'd point out and I'll, uh, is that the difference between these two pictures 
is part of, of, of where we get our, our, of our emphasis. We consider total quality deployed of, of our uh, technologies to be the, the measure, not just, not necessarily the number of uh, remove bugs or the, or the uh, frequency and occurrence rate of, of, of bugs, those kinds of metrics. So we spend a lot of time uh, looking at things from different perspectives. And what does that mean? Well, we do kind of pride ourselves on, on trying to be innovative when solving all of our problems, both our technology problems, our development problems, our product level problems, and our QA and testing needs. And we do try to take a first principles approach. So just look at a couple of examples of this, what, what we do at Google. Uh, if you think of, of the whole concept that we, we are a, a service, and we're, we're, we're probably the most used service in the world these days, with, one, with, with we believe, uh, one of the largest uh, uh, data centers uh, behind us, one of the systems of data centers. What happens when you have a component, a component or a system failure? Well, you can, there's, there's two fundamental, fundamental ways to engineer around that problem. One is, uh, what, I, what I say is the standard approach here, which is just buy really expensive stuff and make sure it's fault tolerant. And you, so, so the, 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 the example here is using RAID equipment for the data that you need to be redundant. So that when one, one, uh, one spindle fails, you have redundancy. Well, our approach actually at a fundamental level is to this problem is much different. It's to develop fault tolerance software to deploy multiple data centers and to ensure that the, the whole system using normal standard uh, products, cheap as a matter of fact, the cheapest components we can get that fit our needs, our needs are high, uh, the whole s at a systems level we're, we're fault tolerant, not necessarily at an individual component level. It's a very different way of looking at things. Uh, similarly, if you look at the problem of a system returning what you might consider the wrong answer, uh, so the standard approach would be to try to debug, to try to tune, to, to try to force, to, uh, algorithmically, to try to get the right answer out of it. But our, our approach is very different. We, uh, we eschew individual tuning. That doesn't, that doesn't mean we don't do it, but that means that's not our first line of defense. What we'd rather do is develop a, an algorithm that will take advantage of the massive amounts of data, the massive amount of use that we'll get, and we'll, over time, uh, with either machine learning, uh, or, or some similar type of approach, tune in the right answer. So try to try to use feedback from the whole system to get the right answer. That doesn't mean we can't remove, we can't spend the time removing bugs. We have to do that first, obviously. But again, the, the, the systemic approach we take is to try to use our machine resources to solve the problem. And referring back to the last slide I, 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 I talked about. Uh, if you look at the problem of the existence of a market, we are, we are trying to create lots of new products. And many of these products, it's, it's problematic whether there is even a market for these new products. And this is where we get the, the, uh, the what does beta mean to Google question. We do, we absolutely do uh, try to get product into people's hands, real users' hands as quickly as possible, which means it may not have a complete, full, feature set that, uh, that we may have spec for the future, but we want to get user feedback. It's a very agile approach. Uh, and you, you see this with Google Labs, so we have lots and lots of, of new products. You see Google with lots of announcements. Uh, we want to make sure that the things we're doing have user traction, rather than have, it have uh, deep, long-lived uh, development paths. So when it comes to the, the, the question of testing and QA, why should our approach be any different? We, we also, uh, that is, well, why should our approach, uh, in terms of fundamentally how we approach it, and we, we still want to take an innovative first principles approach to QA. And with, uh, I'll let Alan and, and others talk about that. I know we have a couple of our people on the uh, agenda. Uh, now now you've got to pay the toll. Now you've got to hear about mobile. But, I, but I, I would, I, what I want is everybody walking out of here wanting to solve mobile QA problems because they are real, they're extreme, and they're very interesting. One of the reasons I, I've been in mobile for 10 years one of the reasons I stay in it because the challenges are so real. Uh, the, the, so, the, so the first question should always be, why do you care? And from our, from our perspective, this is the Google mission that's pretty well known, uh, to organize the world's information, make it universally accessible and useful. There's no, uh, no better way to do this than via a mobile phone, especially when you talk about universally accessible. Uh, that's the thing that you carry with you most, that's your communications device. It, it is likely, we all believe, uh, it's yet to be proven. It's, it's likely to be the, the modus for uh, accessing information in the future most standard uh, way. 
And if you look at the size of the market, uh, mobile subscribers are about two plus times the size of, of, uh, of internet users. These are, these are uh, mobile voice uh, subscribers right now. But we're at about 2.2 to 2.4 billion, depending on how you count it, uh, mobile subscribers today. Uh, internet users are about half that. Uh, I'm not sure you can see this. It's, very, it's, it's small and gray here. Uh, the very interesting thing is, and one of the reasons we, we have a development center here in London that's focused on mobile, is that we are at greater than 100% penetration in mobile in many uh, highly penetrated markets, including most of Western Europe. What that means is you can almost assure yourself that anybody over the age of about 9 or 10 these days has at least the very high probability of being accessible via mobile phone. And it changes the way that people, people communicate. Uh, this, the U.S., uh, by contrast, is at more like 75 to 80 percent. And it, it just hasn't crossed that barrier. Where, where it is certainly a well, an often used modality for communication, but it is not the method of communication. And there's a very different social aspect to that. And again, that's one of the reasons why we spend time here and in Japan and we have uh, development around the world for mobile. Uh, the mobile phone market is about four times the size on an annual basis of the PC market. This market changes hands. The new, new product gets delivered and gets into people's hands very quickly. That means that new capabilities can be out there very quickly. Uh, and we believe that there's going to be a bimodal distribution in the future. There'll be people uh, who only use mobile phones to access data in the internet, whatever the internet large at that point means. Uh, so I won't go through all this, but this is, this is the, the slide says Google, Google Mobile today, sort of, because I took a slide that already existed and, and it's already out of date. Uh, these are our properties that we deliver in mobile now. There are a number of them between search, mobile maps, which is an award-winning winning, uh, Java app. Uh, search, search, I think you know of, you've heard of Google Search, I believe. Uh, Blogger Mobile, our personal home deck with uh, customized for individual use, uh, Gmail, uh, all these products, we're, we're in the process of bringing mobile and, and a number of new products as well. So we have a, a wide portfolio. Uh, but then, then I, I do want to talk a little bit about the challenges. What do we do with this stuff and how do, how do we get in the, in, in the, um, into the mobile world and how do we test it in particular? Uh, and again, anybody who comes up with, the, with some of the right answers here, <laughs> there, are, there are prizes. Uh, so what are the problems? Uh, the, the whole platform, uh, which, which to me means the whole delivery mechanism, the, the, the whole value chain is incredibly fragmented. We have, uh, as opposed to the wired internet, where companies like Google are used to spilling IP onto a, a parent center someplace and just having it show up at the user's uh, desktop, magic happens. And that's good magic for us. We have to engage much more deeply in the connectivity when you talk about mobile. So connectivity mechanisms of not only IP, but SMS, MMS, WAP, uh, WAP push, uh, SMTP, other other uh, uh, mechanisms of, of uh, connecting to mobile devices, some of them uh, proprietary. Uh, you guys don't see this in Europe, you're lucky, but there are several different fundamental airline technologies, and that bifurcates how, how we do a lot of the connectivity, but also bifurcates a lot of the uh, a lot of the devices. So in the States, there's at least three or four. Uh, there's some old stuff. There's some of the, the old lamps and, and, and those things. But in the States, there's, there's uh, CDMA is, is a very big uh, airline. Uh, in, in China and Japan, there are, there are two others. And the States even has something. Nextel had their own proprietary airline technology. Uh, there are many different relevant markup languages. So content formatted for mobile may be formatted in one of, of three or four markup languages. And HTML is still important. That is where we've got, in our case, a huge index of, of data that we'd like to push to mobile. So even though it's not optimal, that's not optimized for mobile, it's important. You end up having three, of, three to six carriers in the country. In the US, there, there are many more, uh, up to 50 or 60, depending on how you count them. And each one of those has uh, connectivity issues. Uh, you end up having, it's still a very juvenile space with incomplete adherence to specs. Uh, in particular, like SYNC is, is one of the big things we'd like to do, but that they suspect for sake, and uh, just about nobody follows it completely, and those who follow it completely can follow it completely different ways between them. Uh, and plat the handset platform themselves are very, very incompatible between Symbian, Microsoft, Palm, 
one of the things that, that uh, Microsoft did for us on the PC world is create a uniform platform which for all that, that Microsoft, uh, I'm not a Microsoft apologist, I did, I did live in Redmond, Washington for 20 years, but I didn't work for Microsoft. The, uh, but, but that is a great thing that, that it enabled us to target really one platform, uh, one path platform that, that moved going forward, but rather than spending our time trying to create abstraction layers and, and deliver multi multiple platforms as the PC world was maturing, there was, one, there was really one specification, and we don't have that. And this is, this is the number that I, I, I use in mobile people in way. It, tur it turns out that, that uh, if you want to create browser technology on mobile devices, there are over 11,000 user agents that we have tracked, that we have preferred, the capabilities tables of, that we may have to respond to when we get a request for search, for instance. That's pretty daunting. Uh, that means that if, uh, so, so Alan, uh, we saw earlier, will be back is in charge of uh, the mobile uh, testing. That means if, if we wanted to test each one of those and not use automation, not use any reasonable techniques, we'd have a lot of fingers pressing, a lot of phones over a lot of networks. Uh, so the savior of mobile was going to be Java. Turns out Java itself is very, very, is very uh, fragmented. Uh, there have been over a thousand JSRs, uh, which are uh, augmentations to Java uh, filed, and, and well, not so. There's not over a thousand, there's about a thousand numbered numbers JSR, I don't know how many has actually made it. When I actually asked my Java guys how many JSRs there are for mobile, the answer was very telling. The answer was, I don't know. So even the guys who spend their time doing Java don't know how many JSRs are important for mobile. We came up with a number of about 85, probably about 20 of which are really important. So if you, if you do the math and then you realize that these are all, these all pile on top of each other and are combinatorial, the, the individual paths through this, this mess is, is pretty daunting, uh, and it requires uh, some really some really good thinking. So a couple other things that really feature into, into this space is that the whole value chain is different, and the value chain is influenced by many different people. It's not the case that you can, uh, like a PC, that one player can interact with a user, get their product in front of the user, and, and, uh, and, and have the user interact directly either with an application provider or a service provider. You, there's carriers, there's, there's OEMs, uh, and the content providers, as well as multiplex into the browser and maybe a carrier portal. So for that reason, we spend a lot of time uh, partnering. Uh, partnering with both the uh, device OEMs, the operators, and ISVs, so the, the software vendors that create the browsers. And that has very distinct implications for how you do test. When you deliver a mass market product through an OEM or through uh, a Vodafone, you spend a lot more time, in, in especially with, with multi-billion dollar OEMs or carriers that are used to dealing with hundreds of millions of subscribers, uh, you can't be quite as ad hoc. They have much more disciplined ways, maybe bit good, maybe bad, but certainly more disciplined ways of certifying the product. And as a, as a vendor like, uh, a provider like Google, we have to be uh, able to interface with them. That's a challenge. It's a challenge to be able to work with uh, big partners like that. So the issues call for a specific comprehensive testing strategy. I'm not going to tell you what that is, but they beg some of the questions that I think you'll be asking today. The, answer, the reason I'm not going to tell you what that is is I don't think we've got it all figured out. It's very hard. Uh, but you need systematic test plans. But you need them to be able to move quickly to, to adapt to what, uh, what you're focusing. But you can cover the complexities and do some sort of separation of variables of, of all these things. And do that in a reasonable way. And do that in a way that's, that's uh, analytic. Uh, and then you'll need to integrate with partners, but it's like, well, like I said, that's, that's hard. So again, if any of you guys have silver bullets here, uh, there are prices. Uh, it does require automation. I know this is testing and automation. I wanted to sort of give you my perspective on the testing, but there's no way with these kinds of numbers, with the 2.2 to 2.4 billion, with the hundreds of carriers, with the, the tens of thousands of phone devices, maybe if we only target 100 of those, there's no way we can be effective in this space without, be, without uh, being automated. But device automation and mobile automation itself is, uh, just, just as for basic testing, is not straightforward. Uh, you don't have control of that device. It's not necessarily pro programmable. It's not necessarily something that you can fix too easily. So that, that's got its own, uh, its own little problems. Uh, and I'll leave you with a couple slides just sort of going forward. It's a, more of the reason that we want to get in the space, get involved, uh, and continue to, to uh, interact with all the players, 
is that uh, we, we believe that we can start providing fairly immersive and very rich experiences. And we're proving that out with some of our partners right now. So we, uh, we need to be good at the basics and then start delivering even better, better experiences. Uh, this, is not to, this, this slide is not to say that we're going to have a desktop in your pocket, but that we do believe that we can deliver forms at desktop. We'll take the huge uh, HTML uh, repositories that we have, our index in HTML, and deliver fundamentally the parts of that information that you want and need to your phone uh, through trans transcoding and other uh, capabilities. Uh, and then in the future, like I said, I've been in mobile for 10 years. But in the future, the, the real desire, uh, the real need for a company like us and for the whole space is to start extend, extending and being able to uh, make the phone do more things. These are uh, some of the, the spaces that we've all been talking about for years. Some of them are coming through. Mobile payment is one of those things that, that, that I refer to as a zero billion dollar market. It's been around, uh, ideas have been around since uh, 2000, 1999, 2001. It was the next big thing, e e uh, and commerce, as with location-based things, another zero billion dollar market, so like artificial intelligence, when is it going to hit? It's starting to, and there are lots of people doing good things, and it will, it will be there, but the issues that I told you about is holding it back. Camera phones are clearly very important. And I think that's really all I, I had to say. I just wanted to give you an idea of what my world will look like for mobile, and turn it back over to Alan. Thanks very much, Shannon. All right, so we have a quick switch over here, and then we will get into this. Okay, great. So, as I said before, if you came in late, my name is Alan Hutchison. I'm your host for the Google Test Automation Conference here in London. This is the first time that Google has ever done a technical conference like this with an emphasis on testing. Uh, and I'm, I'm really pleased that we've had such a great turnout and so many people here who are eager to talk about the subject of tests and test automation. By way of a brief introduction, as I said, I'm the host for the conference. If you have any problems or concerns, come find me. Uh, you can email me at adh at google.com. I'm the manager for one of our testing groups here at Google. Uh, my teams are responsible for mobile testing, as Shannon talked about. And I'm also responsible for all of our testing teams in Europe. My interest in automation testing goes back a long way. I started uh, in this field at Indiana University in the 90s, working on next generation networking platforms. Uh, I started automating testing there because it's really hard to set up 100 routers at a time. Uh, I moved from Indiana University to Cisco Systems and did automation platforms there for several years. I did a couple of startups in the Silicon Valley, uh, mostly around Wi-Fi, and came to Google about two years ago. And since I've been here at Google, I've been doing automation work uh, in a couple of different fields. So. All kinds of fun things, and if you're, you're interested more, I'm sure we'll get a chance to chat later. So, welcome. Why are we here? I think the number one question that I got as we were starting to put this conference together is, why would we have a conference on test automation at Google? So, the real answer is that this is a housewarming. Back in November, we started an engineering office here in London. Uh, our first test people came on in Zurich and London in March and January. We hadn't done testing in Europe before. So I moved out here in May to lead the testing groups here in Europe. And I started thinking about that we need some way to introduce the Google test team to the wider community. And there were a lot of ideas. We could have a barbecue. We could, you know, have a dance. <laughs> but the idea I liked the most was we could have a testing conference. And the best part of it is, I've always thought that the test conferences were not quite technical enough. They didn't have the, the right depth of technical content that I really want to see at a testing conference. 
Well, what I've learned is the cool thing is if you put on your own conference, it has exactly what you want to see. So one reason we're doing a testing conference is because I feel that the community really needs to have much more technical mm -hmm. test conferences. And this conference is an example of the way to do that, or at least a suggestion of the kind of content that I personally would like to see in a test conference going forward. It's also a way to help the community. You know, we didn't charge anybody to come here. Um, the participants only had to pay uh, their travel expenses if they had them to come to the conference. This is one of the only large free test conferences uh, happening in this area. So that's pretty cool. Um, Google's providing the facility, and I'm really thankful to Shannon for uh, letting us kick the entire office out of their lunchroom for two days so that we could take it over and have a test conference here. This is the start of an ongoing conversation. The agenda topics for this conference, well, they're things that I'm very interested in. They're also things that the community as a whole is very interested in. One of the things that we did that was really different from a lot of conferences is that we ask people to write an essay in order to attend. And a lot of people thought this was kind of weird. Um, and, and I agree, it is kind of weird, because most people just say, give us a check and show up. But I'm trying to differentiate this conference from others that you might have been to. You know, if you pay a few hundred dollars and go to Disneyland for five days, you know, you'll learn some things. But you don't necessarily have a group of people who are passionate about test automation. Everyone here is here because they have an interest in automation. So it was great. We asked people to write a short essay about why they wanted to come. We went through all of these responses and uh, pulled out some interesting, uh, interesting thoughts that people had. And I, I want to keep these in mind as we go through the next two days because I think it's really telling where the audience is coming from, where the people who are watching these talks are coming from. And frankly, this is really telling for the people who are going to watch these talks later. Um, as many of you know, we're actually video recording all of these talks. You can see the man with a very large camera back there. And we're going to post all of these talks on Google Video as soon as we can after the conference. Uh, it's my sincere hope that we have them all up by the end of next week. And that means that not only are we having a conference with the people here in this room, but we're having a discussion with people from all over the world. People who couldn't make it to London but are very interested in the topic. People who, uh, in some cases, are students or some cases are uh, instructors who, unfortunately, especially here in the UK, had to go back to school this week. Uh, so I think if this is, as I said, a, a start to a dialogue. We've designed the conference and the schedule for the conference to allow for a lot of interaction. So you'll see that each talk is about 45 to 60 minutes long. There's a formal question and answer period at the end of each talk. And then there's a 15 minute break. You'll see in a lot of, in a lot of conferences where you kind of do six sessions and then you have lunch. And you kind of, it's kind of like going back to school, right? You, you, you take your, your conference bag and your stuff and you, you go from room to room to room and you get to see all of, these all of these talks, but you don't really get a chance to talk to anybody. I hope that you take the opportunity to chat with your fellow participants and speakers over the next couple of days. I think that the most interesting parts of this conference are going to come out of those discussions. So, what are some people interested in? How to calculate the return on investment for test automation. Testing for scalability. Integration testing. Tools. Tools versus, you know, homegrown tools and open source tools versus off-the-shelf tools. Automation, obviously. Uh, how to test JavaScript in Ajax. And we actually have a really interesting presentation coming up on that topic. Uh, Test-driven development, how does that play into the larger QA cycle? How are the 
agile technologies, how are test-driven de development methodologies related to QA? Where is automated testing going? How do we maintain high availability web services? How do we load test massively distributed data centers and web services? How do we scale tests and frameworks? And one of the things that I was most happy to see is uh, a couple of people put in their essay, I am especially interested in sharing experience with my peers. So what are you especially interested in? We've seen a list of quotes that came out of the essays from participants. We saw uh, some things that I'm interested in. You've got the list of speakers and their topics. But what are you interested in? And I'd encourage everyone to take a minute, grab your badge out of the little plastic sleeve, and write a one or two word topic that you're interested in. Look for people who are interested in the same thing. Or look for people who are interested in something completely different. Find people who are interested in topics that you have never heard of. A couple of schedule updates and uh, conference matters that they've asked me to make sure to let you know. Um, first of all, the toilets are that way. Go out to the door you came in and you turn left just before you exit. Um, secondly, there's no smoking here or on the balcony. Uh, there is smoking downstairs at the lower lobby uh, just outside the back. Uh, and look for people with Google badges like these. Uh, they can direct you to wherever you need to do, where you need to go, or answer your questions if you have some. We've had one schedule update. Uh, the testing Metro Wi-Fi talk on Friday that was originally scheduled for 5.15 has been moved to 2.45. And we've also created a session for Lightning Talks. I'm sure a lot of you have seen Lightning Talks at other conferences. Raise your hand if you're familiar with this kind of idea. All right, so like this half of the room, cool. <laughs> so a Lightning Talk is a short five-minute talk that you give on the spot. The idea here is that you can share insights from the conference, present an idea, maybe something that you want to write a talk about in the future but haven't had a chance, or something that just struck you in the next couple of days. Uh, share an experience. If you have something that you think other people here would like to hear about, that makes an excellent subject for a lightning talk. The format is five minutes per speaker, and that is strictly observed. We will pull you off the stage at the end of your five minutes. That means we have 10 slots. Harry Robinson is going to be the facilitator for this. Where's Harry? There he is. Harry's that guy over there. So if you have an idea, make sure to talk to Harry. Uh, you can email him at harryr at google.com. And he will set up your slots kind of on a first come, first serve basis. So uh, there are 10 available right now. If you are going to do slides, which are not required, uh, make sure to send them to Harry by lunch tomorrow. We'll have them all on a single computer so that we can get through all of the talks on time. We're going to do some follow-up from this conference. And I think follow-up is going to be really important for the kind of conference we're doing here. So first of all, when you all go home, you're going to get an email from us that asks how we did, what you thought of the conference, what went well, what didn't go so well, what you thought of the speakers, and if you have comments or suggestions on how we can improve this format. I'm going to read all of that. I'm really interested to see your feedback. So I really encourage you to take the time, write the feedback, and, and know that it's going to be read and responded to. And we're very interested in seeing what you think of this format and this kind of a conference. Uh, outside that, comments and questions, London Test Comp at Google.com. Uh, that goes to me and several others who help organize this conference. So that's an excellent place if you have questions to get them answered. I mentioned that we're going to post the videos from all of these talks on Google Video. Uh, in the email that we send as a follow-up, we'll have links directly to the videos. You'll be able to share those with your colleagues and friends who maybe couldn't come. We'll also post it to the blog and uh, post it in a couple other places. But you'll be able to find those on video.google.com. We'll, we're going to establish a mailing list and there will be instructions on how to sign up. This will be a Google group to continue the discussions that we start here over the next two days. 
Uh, as time goes by, we'll also look at breaking down uh, that mailing list into subgroups if uh, specific interest groups and topics develop. So we're hoping to create an area where we can continue this kind of dialogue uh, well into the future. Finally, for news and information about this conference and uh, anything else that we might do in the future, go to googleresearch.blogspot.com and we will have stuff there. So a couple of thank yous are in order. I really want to thank Google for giving us this space. Uh, I want to thank Shannon for you know, letting us invade London office. Uh, I want to thank the speakers who you know, flew out here on their own dime, who are really interested and passionate on this topic. I want to t thank all of the participants, not only for uh, filling out those essays, because I wasn't quite sure anybody would, but also for, for coming for and participating in the discussion and for bringing your good ideas. And finally, I want to thank the Googlers. You'll see a lot of Google people here. Uh, like I said, they all have badges that look like these. Uh, most of them are wearing Google t-shirts. They've been a tremendous amount of help in this conference. Uh, I'm sure many of you have spoken with Amy, Renee, Veronica, or Anna. Those people have, are really the ones who put this together. I just get to stand up here and take credit for it. So thanks to all of those Googlers, and also thanks to the Googlers who uh, will have to go out for lunch today and tomorrow. So that's all I have. We've got some time for a couple of questions. I think, is Shannon still around? Maybe. If he is, we'll bring him back up. Um, and we've got a couple of people running with mics. So if you have a question, raise your hand. Somebody with a microphone will stop by, and then you can ask your question into the microphone. I know it's still early. How many people flew in from out of town? How many people flew more than two hours? More than six hours? More than eight? More than 12. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right, last chance for questions. One in the back. Hi, um, I was wondering, who actually does testing at Google? Is it, do you have dedicated testers, or are your developers <laughs> people who do testing? So we have both. We, we practice uh, in many teams a test-driven development approach. Uh, I think Agile is very popular inside Google. And of course, I have an entire team of dedicated testers, many of whom are here, if you want to raise your hands. Google testers, they're all over the place. Uh, feel free to grab those people during the, during the conference if you want to talk about testing in Google with them. Or come and grab me. I occasionally do testing. <laughs> Other questions? Okay, our first talk will be at 10.15, so you've got a little time to get a refreshment, catch your breakfast if you didn't, got here a little late. And uh, if I can have the first speaker for 10.15 up here, we'll get you all set up. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>